Hey everybody and welcome to today's show. On today's show we have Michael Wong who you might know on the internet as Mizco, super interesting designer from Australia. He started out as a freelancer, grew an agency, then closed it to open up his startup. And we're gonna discuss his whole journey and takeaways from each state of his journey and why he did things the way he did, very successfully in my opinion. Check this out, I think you'll enjoy this conversation. Hey Michael, what's up? Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for for coming on. What's up? How are you? Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much for having me, man. I, it's it's I'm sort of like mind blown, and it's very weird uh, to actually be talking to you because I'm so actually, I'm so used to watch, uh, seeing you on a YouTube video. So it's, it's pretty unreal. So me. welcome. So you are now on, on a YouTube video. <laughs> You're now on the yeah. channel, <laughs> dude. Like and I, yeah. I, I've been looking forward to this conversation, like, because I've been following you around, you know, from from Twitter and and you know, seeing your work, which is incredible. So I was really, really looking forward to to talking to you and hearing a little bit about how you do all the things that you're doing. Because honestly, you are kind of like living my dream. So um, I want to dive into that. You know, you you have a startup going, you have a design agency going, you're, you're doing a lot of projects. So um, I want to dive into that. But let me get started with this. You know, I've, I've been checking out your website and there's something that I found mm-hmm. kind of like, I don't know if weird, but I want to ask you, is that intentional? So when I'm going into your website, the title says um, freelance designer or freelance UX uh, product designer UX, yeah but then you know when yes. you tell your story it turns out that you're an entrepreneur and that you actually run a design studio so like what is is that kind of like sound inconsistent or is that on purpose like why are you framing yourself as a freelancer versus i don't know studio owner or something like that yeah so you're digging right into my secrets here <laughs> um but so i guess um yes I, I, from like a experience point of view it's it's very inconsistent um but at the same time uh i've had the misco.net domain for i i don't even remember for how long i think like seven years um and the seo in the juice in that domain is incredible incredibly strong okay um so if you actually search for or if you're in australia and you're searching for a freelance ux designer or freelance ui designer um or sydney ux designer I'm actually ranked either first or second or third, oh, um, always in the, in the top fold. So I guess running from that website, it sort of evolved as well. Um, there's always a, a personal portfolio and I get a lot of inquiries through it. And I guess as my career has evolved and as I've progressed, um, my career has naturally just gone down the path of becoming an entrepreneur and actually starting my, up my own thing. So the design agency and then also like ladder, ladder itself. So I wanted to maintain that, uh, that ranking, the SEO ranking, but then also tell the story of, I'm more than just a designer. I can think through products uh, holistically. Um, I have a very strong business mind- mindset and I use design to help you sort of like make your sort of product uh, mm. flourish and, okay, and grow. That's smart, that's smart. So basically you came from that, you started out as a freelancer, you bought, you built all the kind of like ranking or, or expertise and then you still use that to to channel it as do you get kind of like leads for your agency from your personal website? Yeah, so I guess yeah, pretty much that that that's it. Um, everyone sort of knows me as a designer, as a UX designer, um, and that is definitely my background, and that's where my my core skill set li- uh, lies. Um, but through that, I'm able to start businesses and build apps uh, for the larger market because. I've got strong skill sets in UX design. So yeah, and the people that do come through are always looking for project uh, product design work. Um, so yeah, I guess it's sort of like two birds, one stone. Cool. Like, I, I, I feel like I was in the same situation where you know I was doing freelancing and then starting to wonder, should I turn this into agency or not? Or at least that's something that I've been thinking about a lot. So I would love to hear from your perspective, like what was the journey like? Like at what point did you realize that you have to grow or did it, did it come from that or how did that transition happen? Uh, I think it's, so my, the story of like how I started is that is actually quite, it's quite a, a journey. Um, I, on, so what I did was I actually started 
when I was 16. That's when I had my first, well, I sort of like had the first version of Photoshop installed on my computer. Um, I, I wrote my first line of CSS. So I was actually a gamer when I, when I sort of like got into uh, the whole design realm. I was a gamer looking to make some money. Um, so I was a gunbound player and I had all these rare items that I wanted to, to sort of sell. I uh, sort of like was winding down the game and I was like, how do I make some money? So I had all these rare items and I was like, can I sell these items to other players? Because they were actually very valuable and people actually wanted them as well. You could trade. So I learned, I actually created a, a online forum and then I sold that, uh, sorry, I created an online forum and I was spamming the chat room to tell people to come join that forum. And uh, eventually more and more people joined and then I was able to actually sell my items. I added a couple of, of uh, ads onto the forum and I started making some money. And very, very early on in my career, or I wouldn't say it's my career, but very early on in this journey, I sort of understood uh, design, a bit of code and the idea of actually making money online. So that's getting traffic through that also experience. sounds like getting, cool. yeah, getting yeah. traffic, um, spamming chat rooms to, <laughs> to get people, keeping people engaged by, um, I had like a section where people could introduce themselves and I was like, okay, I don't want to leave them hanging without any responses. So very early on, I was already doing a lot of in- like retention stuff, which I never knew it was like a retention sort of a, um, I think that a task that you could do to get people more retained on a Basically platform. you built a product. Like, uh, when you think about it. Exactly, right. Yes, so if you think, if you actually think about, about it, a forum and a community similar to the designership, it is a product in itself. Like you need to, you need to build it, you need to grow it, you need to retain people, um, and you need to deliver value for people to come back. So ex- exactly, like you said, it's exactly the same. Um, so my first product was actually, yeah, a forum, and I continuously uh, built more and more forums for different games, um, for des- one for design as well. And then that led me into doing a, a bit of affiliate marketing because I was trying to sell products on the forum. And through that, I, I, that led me into affiliate marketing on like a full scale uh, operation. I had my own, uh, um, my whole sort of operation of like a network of like 20, 30 around sites or promoting products, uh, CPA offers and all that. And then that led me into sort of like the design, design realm. How, how did that like, that doesn't sound like the natural thing to go be from affiliate marketing into it, design. So what led into the design? Yeah. So it was a very interesting um, journey because when you're doing affiliate marketing, it, you, you're, re- you're very focused on making a sale, right? And for you to make a sale, you really need to understand a customer's pain points. Um, and it's, it's all about, it's all about marketing. Now in UX design, it's a very, very similar sort of, uh, 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 train of thought. You need to understand the user's problems and how can you get them from A to B, um, from where they are to the value as quick as possible and as, as seamless as possible. So the the task and the, the mindset is very, very similar. So even though I came from affiliate marketing background, applying that into products, right? I build, a, I build a product. How do I get people to come to this product? Now people are using the product. How do I retain them to, to make a sale? It's still all about the psychological triggers, um, delivering value to the to the user, and it's really exactly the same um, in selling products, in my opinion. That's um, interesting. I never heard this. Yeah, I never heard yeah. about this kind of like uh, comp- comparison of uh, kind of like yeah. So like, because you think about it, like nowadays, like everyone talks about like growth hacks and um, how do you grow a product really quickly. Really, like I guess what's allowed me to really progress in in my career is because. I was really doing all this stuff um, and it became second nature because it was the only way I could actually grow that product. And with all that, all those insights and all that, that experience, as UX became a thing and more and more people wanted to be, become a designer, I guess I was lucky enough, I was in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. I had already built that experience and those insights. So um, when UX started booming, I was sort of at the forefront already. Um, I was, just, I was just very lucky to, to be uh, at the right place. But then again, you also, like, I can understand how your skills from marketing translate into understanding, you know, the UX process and, and growth and all of that. But in terms of like design, I don't know, sensibilities, understanding, you know, like the graphical nature of design, like visual side of it, were you like learning it by yourself? How did you become, because like, I look at your design, it looks amazing. Like, how did you pick that up? 
Yeah, so that was, um, yeah, I had a real passion. For, so I've always really enjoyed art. Um, I did art throughout high school and I always just enjoyed design. Um, when I first started out in design for, for the online space, I was actually just uh, copying other people's designs. Um, I do remember I would go into CSSmania.com. I don't even know if they exist anymore. Um, awards, uh, the, first iter- the first version of awards, and I would literally just copy a design and turn it into my own, and then I would try to build it as well. Mm-hmm. And that was how I learned the You mean like by coding? Coding, yeah. yeah. So I would actually try to build it in Dreamweaver. <laughs> um, and then eventually I used uh, Coda, which was the first HTML editor um, uh, app that I used on a, on a Mac. And I would just literally just try to get all, all to work. And it was just, I was young, I was curious, and I just wanted to, to, to bring a design to life. That was my goal. And seeing that, seeing it all come to, to life just was so rewarding. Amazing. So what made you do, like, sounds like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing uh, like, I'm making money, like doing affiliate sales. Why would you transition into becoming like a freelance designer? Um, so I or guess that was, was that, was that the that transition? Was, Is that what happened? Yeah. So it was, it was a, there was a moment in time where um, affiliate marketing sort of dried up for myself. Like, uh, I think I was around 21 at the time. Um, I got a little bit bored of like affiliate marketing. Everyone was starting to jump on, on the bad bandwagon, um, become quite saturated. And I thought to myself, even though it brings in great money, a lot of money, I wanted to do something that was a bit more fulfilling. It was because I had already, I knew what the formula was. It was just about scaling. It was a lot of manual work of just scaling out the operation. And I, I thought to myself, I need to get out there. I need to meet some people. I need to sort of like drop my ego, drop my pride and work with people and learn from others who have done this for so many more years. So I joined a startup, which is freelancer.com. I'm sure, I'm sure many designers have heard yeah, of this of website. You can uh, you, like, as a full-time, for, like as a full-time designer or just listed yourself as a freelancer there? No, no, no. So I was actually part of the, the Australian of the team. team, the right. startup team. Okay. Yes. In building out that platform. Right. So I as joined a full-time Freelancer employee. and that was Ever, yes, as a full-time employee. employee. Okay. Yeah. And then we, we, on that website, it was quite an interesting experience because they, the team was pr- predominantly a engineering team and it was very growth uh, driven. So very data driven. And that sort of, um, with my knowledge in like affiliate marketing and also design, we'll come in with features, we'll, we'll build them up, we'll, uh, launch them and scale them. We would see how designers would like use the platform and little little things that we did in driving metrics, right? So I love that. That's what I've been doing for sort of like my entire career is like how how to use my design knowledge and my affiliate uh, marketing knowledge and build a product and feature that actually moves the needle. That's what I've been doing and doing that for two years and helping building out the design team. I thought to myself, why not jump back out into the industry and apply what I've learned to, to uh, like a wider range of uh, startups and products. So you've been, you've so been with the company to... during its growth phase, like when the team grew? It was, it was, a very, it was very early on. Okay. Um, the freelancer team was around 10, 20 people at the time. I think now they're over 150, I believe. That's the last time I've sort of like checked up. But uh, yeah, that's, that's how it went. Yeah, cool. And your role was, was like it, a product very, designer? Yes, exactly. Yeah, it was a product designer. At the time, it was called a web designer. I don't think right. product okay. or US designer <laughs> was actually was there yet. But um, yeah, it was a web, web designer role. Cool. Um, so, okay, so now you're moving into becoming a freelancer. And I'm, I'm looking at like the, the, the roster of clients that you've worked with, which are, you know, they're amazing. And you've also positioned yourself in like, I'm working with, you know, with... Y Combinator startups or, or tech stars or like very, very good, I think, startups. How did you get into that specific niche and, and found those amazing clients? So I guess I think building a personal brand is definitely, um, definitely opened up those opportunities. Like it opened up the doors for me to, to meet these great entrepreneurs. But I think it's also... What does that um, mean for you? What does that mean for you? Like personal brand? What does that mean? So I guess like Twitter, to, you to, mean Twitter? Uh, I think it's more than just Twitter. I think it's um, to, to give us a little bit of a backstory um, at freelancer.com. 
uh, I, my design manager, I'm sure many designers actually know of this person, Adam Dunaway. Um, he actually gave me the, the nudge into starting my own personal brand. He said, if you want to stand out, you need to be, you need to do something different. Um, and I thought to myself, how, how, how can it be different? How do I build this brand? And I was around 19 or 20 at this time. I never thought about my career, um, tra trajectory. It was all about, oh, like someone, like my managers told me to do this. I should, I should do it and, and see what, and see what comes out from it. So at the time, if you actually look up Google Mizco, uh, .net or like Mizco, the keyword, you will see some really out there type of, uh, design ideas I came up with. I was dressed, I dressed myself up as a ninja <laughs> and I claimed to be the web design ninja and I would like slide up. I would slide up from like the, the bottom of the screen and I'll slide in from the left and I, I was using jQuery to do this stuff. And at the time, I was really anxious and embarrassed to launch this, but I was like, you know what? Like, what's the worst that, that, that could happen, right? So I actually launched it, went to CSS Mania, went, got featured on the FWA. It was, it was crazy. I did not uh, know people would- Super interesting. Sort of like, How did you, why did you decide to go, why did you decide to go with Mizco versus your name or? Um, so Mizco was actually a nickname, uh, an online alias that I came up okay. with, uh, very early on. I was like, I think I was 15 or something. During I was on your a design gamer, forum. gamer phase? Yeah, during that gaming phase. Yeah. So I actually was part of a 3D rendering uh, design community. And the admin or like the owner of that community was, his name was Zenko. Um, and he sort of inspired me in sort of like the design realm. And I thought like, how do I make my name? Like, how do I join Zenko and Michael together? And I, I came up with Mizco. And I've always I've kept that name ever since. I've tried to find Zenko um, again to sort of like see what he's doing now, but I can't seem to find him. Um, but yeah, that, that's where Mizko came from. Okay, awesome. So for you, personal branding meant like having a website that just stands out and it's different from, and that people would talk about and stuff like that. Yeah, so like a website that sort of gets you out there. That was like the first step. And then Twitter, Dribble and my newsletter have come in as a very strong channel as well. So How Twitter, I would all, yeah, yeah Twitter, Twitter started very early on. So I've got around, I think like 40, I think it's 40,000 now. I think back, back when Twitter was, wasn't that big, I had already joined and I was already quite active. So getting the followers sort of like snowboard had like a snowball effect. Like when you, when you become, sort of like popular on Twitter, they'll push you, they'll recommend you to other designers and it's sort of like followed on. But Twitter's a, a very active community for designers. So that was a great way to reach out to my followers. Um, and also my newsletter has been a great way for me to build a relationship, like a, a deeper relationship with my followers as well. So I was writing an, uh, an article every single week and then it became a month and now it's sort of like very ad hoc because I've just got so much going on. Yeah. But uh, I had some really great conversations, very deep conversations with some followers and um, I was able to help them. They were able to also help me as well. Like they, they would read about um, how I'm progressing and they'll like give me tips. So that was a great way to actually build a strong relationship. And you think that having those like big followings is what helped getting those, those cool clients? Like, by the way, do you work with clients from San Francisco? Cause you're based in Australia. Are you working remotely or is it like local startups, Australian startups that, how did that um, work for you? So it's, it, it's really, it's sort of changed over the years. I remember when I first started uh, freelancing, um, this was, I, w I would say maybe eight, around eight years ago the market in Australia was very quiet and the American market was just huge. And I don't think that many designers were sort of known or like they were, they weren't very like really promoting themselves or anything. So when I first started freelancing, predominantly my client base was all from America, which is, I was very surprised. Um, that was when Adobe reached out for the first time and uh, Lantern, which is a Y Combinator startup as well, like a mental health one. I don't remember how they found me, I think it was via Twitter or Dribble. I'm not. I can't. I can't remember. But America was definitely a very like a very. A and large you did, you, of my with all base. of them, you worked remotely. Remotely, yeah. It was. Yep. Yeah, I think it's. It was all via Skype at the time, um, and it everything went quite smoothly. Hmm. And then now it's 
transitioned and a lot more of it is from Australia. But mainly that's because the market's booming in Australia. Um, really? A lot that's of people so, trying to know, get into the tech scene. That's so interesting. I just got, you know, I just got an email from somebody from Australia telling me like yeah. the situation in Australia is like is so bad i don't know there was a crash in i don't know what coal or he explained to me that the situation in australia is so bad and he can't get any work and he's broke and like oh my god australia sucks to be here right now and now you're telling me like oh things are booming and it's great in australia so i'm, I'm trying to understand like i guess it depends on i don't know where you are and how you see things but how like how does that work for you yeah i i think I think it's always, uh, well, first off, I'm always a, a very half full, um, half, half glass full type of person. So I will always, I like to, at least I like to see that it's a positive, uh, it's a positive economy in Australia. But I also, I think it depends on, like I said, like how you brand yourself, right? So if you have a strong brand, um, if you, ha- I've got very strong sort of SEO as well. Um, pe- if people will search Sydney freelance designer, like I'm, I'm like first or second. I'm, I'm very out there. So I've got my name out there and I've built a, the Visco brand for so many years now that I don't really do promotions and people will, will come through. So not to say I'm the best designer, but I'm obviously very active in sort of like sharing my journey on social media, on search engines, on LinkedIn. So people do know of me. And at the same time, because they can't, I, I believe the market's actually growing, like everyone's trying to get into this space. They're, that means more and more designers are coming into the market as well. So that means less and less work for one in individual designer. Um, so if you're actually looking for work, uh, I think it's really, you should definitely spend time in building out your own brand because that's what's going to last moving forward. Um, if you're sort of just trying to reach out cold core clients or like you're actively reaching out to clients, it's, it's great and that's obviously what you need to do, but if you forget to build a brand, then it's a very short term sort of solution and it's not gonna be a, be a sort of like a, a solution that's gonna last for the long term. Yeah. So at what, t- <clears throat> at what point did you say, I need to start an agency or hiring people? Was that the journey or like, is that how it happened? Um, so yeah, building the journey was actually quite, uh, building the, not the journey, building the agency was actually quite, uh, interesting it sort of just happened i never actually had the plan to build an agency because it's not really what i what i'm passionate about um building products is what i'm passionate about but because so much work was coming through it sort of naturally just happened i um i was under the pump and it just i couldn't i couldn't let go i couldn't say no to all these interesting uh, products that came through so that's why i decided to make my first hire and, and are they like full-time employees? Do you got like an office or is it just like freelancers that you work with? Like, how does that work for you? Yeah, so Misco Media, when we were, st- when we were still running, I actually decided to, to wind Misco Media oh, really? down okay. um, when, I started, when I started up Ladder. Okay, uh, I thought you yeah, were running we were, them at the same time. No, oh, I, there was actually a, a thought about that, but for us, it was more about if we're in, we're, if we believe in an idea, we should just go all in okay. and see where that takes off. Okay. Um, but during, yeah, during this media, it was all uh, full-time employees because when you're building an agency, i at least for myself, what I believe in is that it's not just about the money. It's about the relationships. It's about building a, a team, a close knit team. It's if you're building a product, yeah. If you just have people sort of come in, come in and then leave, it's sort of, you don't really get to solve that problem effectively. I feel like everyone needs to be in the office, part of the team and really sink their teeth into like the problem set, yeah. work together. So I wanted to make sure that um, if I was to build Misco Media that we did it properly. We probably did, we probably didn't make as much money if it was all contractors to be honest, because um, people, yeah, people would just come and go. Uh, but I think in the long term, and especially what I value, which is relationships and actually making, jo- like a, making work enjoyable, that's the path that I decided to take. So how, how long did you run it before you understood that you actually want to start a product company? Two years. Well, I think for myself, I, I knew from day one that I wanted to run a, a product company, like a SaaS, a SaaS product. Uh, but I guess at the time, yeah, there was just so much great, uh, great, like great work. I think I just decided to, yeah, build out the agency and see how it goes and sort of like, 
it was my first time in actually building up a, a company from from the ground up, employing uh, my first my first hire, and then growing to a team of eight. So it was a very exciting a journey. It was very fulfilling because it was my first time doing this stuff, and it was all working quite well. I learned a lot about business, about runway, cash flow, and all that all that type of stuff. So it was a, it was a great experience, in my opinion. Do you feel now, looking back, that it was a sidetrack into the thing that you actually wanted to do, or would if you would you do that again? I guess <laughs> that's my question. Would I go back down the the agency route? I guess I don't know. Um, I think it would. It's oh, that's a tricky that's a tricky question. Um, I'm not sure if I would go down the the agency route. Uh, I would def- most definitely go down the freelance route. Um, I would probably hire one full-time designer and maybe one full-time uh, developer and work on sort of small products in-house and maybe do like one big project at a time. But I don't know if I will go down the route of a full-scale agency again. Yeah. Because it's just, it's, uh, it's, I guess like when I, yeah, when I talk to some of my business mates, it, it's like a hit of sort of crack, right? Like when you're, when you're doing agency, you get a big project big brand and it's like it feels great and then you sort of move on dies down and then it's the next one next one dude you know it's the actual it's the exact i have a business coach i'm working with and he told me you're addicted to selling design because and it's just like (laughs) you said it's like a hit of crack it was like ah great project (laughs) and then you need another one Uh, yeah and then it goes down real quick and then you're like okay where's the next when's the next hit and then you get get it again and then it's the next thing next thing um, and I think it's great. I think like with any, any designer, I think to sort of, you can never, right. But for you to really get the hang of design and client interactions and presentations and doing just upskilling, being part of an agency definitely helps because you're just constantly churning, 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 you're getting used to it. And the more, the more you practice, the better you get. But at least for me, I like to see a product uh, through, not just, when the design's completed, I like to see like when it's completed, how does it actually impact users? Um, the people that use it, is it a positive impact? Is it a negative impact? How do we improve this? What are the metrics that we need to push? How do you turn this into a business now? How do you make money from it? All those questions and all that is what I actually value a lot. Um, and I find that very interesting. The design aspect is just a very small part of the things that I actually enjoy when it comes to product design. So. Can you take us to this like moment in time where you realized, hey, I actually want to start like a product company and that I need to make a change. Like how did that came to happen? Yeah. Because it doesn't so sound like it's, a, I, it's an easy decision, especially if you're a team of eight and, you know, it's pretty radical. Yeah. So at the time I had uh, my mate Dan, um, he introduced me to uh, my co-founder, uh, now, um, at, the, at the time, he goes, you should meet uh, V. He did the same sort of thing as you. He runs a dev agency. You run a design agency. You guys should just link up, uh, say hi, get to know each other, and just become friends. So then I actually met uh, V, and we had like a few chats. We were very aligned in what we wanted to do. We were both running an agency, but we actually we both wanted to eventually run, uh, go down the, the path of, uh, of building a product, um, a SaaS product or any sort of like tech product, right? So... We actually shared a couple of client projects together. So he, I did the design, we did the design, and then we, he did the development. And then that got handed over to the client. We did a number of those and we sort of thought to ourselves, like, hey, like we actually worked well, well together. So why not let's try work on an idea together and see like how far we can take this. So since he's an engineer and he had a team of engineers, I was a product designer, I had a team of designers. It was very natural for us to bounce ideas around what we were good at, so design and dev. So V goes, why don't us, why don't we actually go down the path of building a sort of like a marketplace for uh, engineers and then eventually designers, but with a twist, we want to really focus on the UX and not just build out another job board. So that sort of like the idea started bouncing around. We played around with a few different ideas and that was all on the side. We did that for around six months and eventually we got to a point where we we're like, things are going a little bit serious. We we're actually quite passionate about the idea. And we sort of spent more resource. We put like uh, a designer and a de- developer full time on it, but we were still we, were, we found it very difficult for us to really focus because we had so many uh, client work, uh, client projects happening. 
And then it got to a point where we go, we said to each other, if we're serious about this idea, let's wind down the agencies because that shows that we're both actually serious because running the agencies was very profitable. It was a great business. Um, but if we, if we were happy to give that up for this idea, it would really show that we're both very best, quite vested in, in this uh, new problem set that we're trying to solve. So we actually eventually went down that path after I think six months of sort of like bouncing back and forth. Should we do it? So much money in this, but we both believe in something bigger. Like the agency can only grow so much. Um, the downfall about agencies is that for it to scale, you need more headcount and that just becomes too much overhead. And it's just a bit like, it's just too much stress um, for what it is. And then that's when we decided to actually make the switch. So, so it actually, it was live at that point, like it started as a side project. You already created some kind of a version one of it and it was live. And then, then you've made the decision. Um, so, or was we it had, just like yeah, an idea a, at that point? It was an idea. Um, but what we did was we did have a few client projects running to help feed us so we can actually, uh, have dedicated people working on the product and building, building it out. So it was a bit of like half off. We were sort of like doing a half off. Were you kind of like trying out the kind of like lean methodology or like MVP type of thing? Like kind of like how the startups that you work with work when building your own, your own product? Yeah. So we did, we did do like a lot of uh, agile sort of um, things. So we did like a lot of the research we built internally, we built uh, a number of products internally, and then we were testing with, with users. So that was it. But because when it came to like a marketplace, it was a little bit mm. difficult to go MVP because customers and companies expect something that's fully fleshed. So the marketplace was a very ambitious sort of like goal that we're trying to hit. And I sort of believe that the timing as well just wasn't right um, for us because people said people that we spoke to, and I think it's a, 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 a very common sort of a statement that people say, like they don't really enjoy working with, uh, recruiters, but a lot of the insights that we did gain when they were using the platform was that do I spend sort of like 30 minutes to an hour updating my profile, doing the preferences, or do I just go pick up the phone and call someone for an hour and that will actually get me a job straight away because the market is that. The market is that there is a shortage in, in uh, great developers in Australia. So it actually doesn't work that effectively because everyone is trying to get them a job. So they're, they don't really need to go onto a platform. So it's very interesting when you go down the, the path of um, a startup and very innovative ideas is that you, the idea might be great and people say that they would, they love it, but the timing just isn't right. So we're, go, we're currently going through that experience, that, uh, that stage of the startup where we're, somewhat pivoting and we're t trying different ideas uh, to see what sticks with developers and designers. Cool. What, did you raise money for that startup or are you bootstrapping it? Like what's, what's no, the strategy? Purely bootstrapped. Yeah. Yeah. Purely bootstrapped. Why? I, what, I, can't, like, I, I love I bootstrapping. I love bootstrapping, but you know, just because you've been working with so many, uh, you know, venture capitals and, and Y Combinator, it's interesting to, to hear from your perspective, why you chose bootstrapping versus raising money for it? I think at the time, I guess, to be honest, we, we had extra funds um, in the company. So we didn't want to go down the, the, the political route of like having VCs and having uh, Just advisors you could afford and all that. It, you mean? Yeah, I think it was for us that we, we generally believe in this idea. And if we don't have to raise, we, we thought we shouldn't raise. And I think that's just how I, that's how I see things is that, yeah, if, if I can afford it, then I should invest into it. Right. Because that shows that I'm, I believe in it. I don't, I would rather play with my own money than invest this money, but that's just at this point in time, obviously, if you're looking to scale your company, you're trying to do, you're trying to take over the world, trying to take out all the lights, uh, in the, in the room, then obviously you need to raise massive capital and you want to do bigger things. But as of right now, we're at a very early stage and we're just trying to see, test the market and see what sticks with developers. And if we can fund it ourselves, I think it's, it just keeps things a lot easier for us. But if you've, if you've shut down the agencies, like how can you fund it just from like a pool of money? 
Like, how do you keep yeah, sustaining? Yeah, just, just for my pool of money at the moment. Okay, so you do have some kind of, uh, yeah, so yeah, I, I forgot the, the word, like, runway. Like, you, you know how many months yes, you can we, afford oh, to yeah. do this. Yeah. Yep, exactly. So we've done all the planning, the financial forecast, and the, the runway. So we know how much like, every month, how much, we're, uh, how much we're spending, and how many, how, much, how many more months we have left. So we've kept that all, all in mind. And how long have you been doing that for? We've been doing, we've started ladder, like officially with everyone on board, it has been around four or five months okay. now. Um, so it's, it's months. been like five months since you've shut down the agency, like properly, stopped taking client work and stuff like that? Yeah, around, I think it's around three, yeah, four, I think four months, four months. I think mm -hmm. beginning of March would be around four months this year. Was it scary? So, <laughs> It was scary. Yes, it was scary. And it was, it was actually, it was quite sad as well. Like to see, um, Misco Media, it was actually doing very well. It was flourishing. Um, we had so many great clients reach out. And even to this day, I haven't been checking my uh, Misco Media email, but I logged back in, I think like a week or two weeks ago. And there are so many emails. So many people are, are looking for, for, uh, work, um, design work and strategy work. So, it's sad to, to close it down, but I think on the other hand, it's what I've wanted to do. And so I, let me ask you a question. Honest, like, why didn't you, yeah. not, why did you not either sell it or cause it sounds valuable or second, just bring in another CEO to replace yourself and just like be a business owner of that while you do something else. I think that comes down to, so the first one, uh, s selling it is, the Mizco brand is a very personal brand. Um, I couldn't really let someone else manage a Mizco company. I think that just wasn't right. And people, so I've actually built a brand where people really want me to uh, look for me to look over the, the project. So if I wasn't part of that sort of like that journey, then I don't, it would actually hurt the name in the long run. Um, and I think the reason why Mr. Media has done so well is because of the results that we've been able to, to uh, produce for our clients. It wasn't just, oh, the design looks great. It was actually the fact that it was moving the metrics uh, for the company. So not to say that designers don't think about that, but that's actually my, for, like my core focus. And that's what I love about design is that we actually influence how a company grows uh, through the experience, right? And the strategy and the tips and the insights that I can provide my clients that's what my clients actually pay for. And that's what they really enjoy. And that's why the company has grown so much. Um, because I think there are so many designers out there who do better visual design than, than myself. Um, but I guess my core focus, like, yeah, like I said, is really the business side of things and how we can craft an experience from the ground up. So it's cheap to build. It moves the needle, uh, it pushes the, yeah, the, the right metrics that we need to and provide a strategy for them to actually grow and they go, okay, what's the next step? What's the next step? What should we build next? All that stuff is sort of um, experience that I've had from very from very early on. And trying to find someone who can replicate that was just very difficult and would be very, I think, very expensive as well. So I guess for me, it was, I was happy to just wind it down. And then if I do want to spin it back up, then I can always spin it back up yeah. and at least the brand isn't tarnished and I haven't taken that risk of having someone else manage it mm. for me. Yeah, so it's kind of like, I would feel like it's kind of like a safety net. If things doesn't go, you can always bring that up back up. Is that true? Is that yes? Correct? Yeah, exactly. So like I pop over, I literally popped up, open the email um, this afternoon, and there was like two new emails that came through, and they're looking to do like a fully flesh product from the ground up. So there's always yeah, there's always work uh, for for me. So it's not something, it's something I don't really stress about. So what's what's your goal with ladder? Is it like because you said we're not looking to, I don't know, take over the world and, uh, you know, take out all the lights or, or whatever and raise massive capital. So what would you like that to become? Uh, I don't like the, like the phrase uh, lifestyle business so much. I feel like it's, at least in the startup ecosystem, it's, it's I don't know why I feel it's condescending, but uh, what are you looking to achieve with it? I guess, I guess what I want to do is like, as of right now, obviously if we can grow, uh, if, if it can go massive, um, again, go global and stuff, that'd be great. So the whole marketplace idea was to stay in Australia first, um, and then 
grow it internationally. Uh, but we just from what we've been doing and the people that we've been talking to and actually making the connection, there was like a lot of operational costs uh, that that came with it and a lot of overhead of having people managing accounts and stuff. So we've made a, a slight pivot in what we're doing. And if you actually check it out on ladder.ai right now, it's a place for developers to automatically sync all the developer uh, social accounts into one place. Okay. Now, what what we want to do is the thing the thing that V and I really believe in is we want to be able to empower designers and developers. Like the, these are the markets that we're uh, we're sort of like part of ourselves. Empower them with the tools and the knowledge so they can flourish in their careers. So I think I've sort of like hit that point in my career where I don't really go any higher, in my opinion. Yes, I could probably, uh, I could go for like a head of design role, head of UX role where I manage a big team. But in the case, in the, in the case of sort of the, the actual core skills, the hard skills, I don't think I can sort of like grow anymore. So I've always wanted to give back and that's why I've done the newsletter. I started the designer share. It's always about giving back. I've, I've just, I don't see myself growing anymore. So trying to educate people is what I'm trying to do. And through these tools like ladder.ai now where people, developers can like aggregate all the stuff, we want to make it easier for them to put together like a, a quick portfolio of all this stuff that they've done online into one place and then use it as a CV. So we're, we're trying to pivot the idea and just create more tools that empowers um, our target market. That's pretty much it. It's interesting what you said that you think that, I'm not sure I understood it correctly. Do you think that you can't grow anymore? Or as a, as a designer or as a, or as like, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so as a designer- Or maybe you're I, not interested I, in growing at, specifically as a designer. Yeah, so I think for me is that, I think there, when, as a designer, there are many different uh, niche areas that you can sort of like uh, grow into. So you can become an illustrator, you can be a, a, a UI designer, you can be a UX researcher, all that sort of stuff. I feel like I've plateaued in a lot of that. And even if I was to go um, work for Google and stuff, I just don't think that the, the learnings that I can I will gain from that is worth the investment of my time. I saw that you're learning so coding what, right now or something that you yes, did. Yeah, exactly. So I actually feel like I've there's not much to learn in design anymore because I've actually I've built products. I've scaled them to millions of users. Um, I've built products that people are vouched for and they actually love. I've built a design community that people love as well. So I'm, so I'm trying to actually find something that I'm, that can sort of fuel my, my passion as well. So now I'm learning uh, JavaScript, something that I've always put off and I've always procrastinated when it came to upskilling. So now that I'm working with V in building Ladder, where he's actually teaching me how to uh, build some logic, build some uh, components in Vue.js. And then that's something that I'm trying to work on myself. And I guess if you understand code and you understand all the logic behind it and the infrastructure and the architecture, then you, myself, I can actually grow as a designer in that way. Let's talk about designership. Where, where does that came, yeah. like what's, how did that came to be and what's, what's the place of that in your life? Yeah, so designership was actually a very, uh, it, it sort of, it flourished and it started, it started off as a, a side project. So I was freelancing at the time and I was actually uh, just coming out from my quarter life crisis. And I was just trying to like, I was trying to get myself back on track. And um, since I was freelancing, coming out of my quarter life crisis, it was a bit lonely, like working by myself all the time. And I was like, I said to myself, there has to be a place where I can, like a trusted community of designers that I can turn to. Um, why can't I find one? I've got the following. I've got people that can tweet me when, um, I'm asking a question stuff, but why is it just, why can't they only interact um, when I'm asking a question? Why can't everyone be part of this? So then I actually started the Slack channel and it, there was only a couple of, of like hundred people at the, at the time. But over the year, like over the, the last sort of one and a half years to two years, it's grown to 11,000 people all organically and I haven't even touched it. Designers are just referring their friends and every, nowadays, I can, today like there's like 10, like 10 different people asking different questions like hundreds of people actually uh, commenting and replying. So it's great that it's sort of evolved into its own community. Um, so that's where it actually started. It just started from a problem that Are I Are you still creating. active in that community? Yeah, so to, yeah, I, I actually started jumping back in recently. 
um, answering questions and like sort of like welcoming people and stuff. Because this year where, since we we broke Slack multiple times, where uh, 11,000 people, so Slack is constantly deleting a lot, a lot of our uh, messages and archiving them. So we're, going, we're actually gonna migrate over to our own open source uh, chat platform. Okay. So hopefully that will become a like a bigger thing and allow people to chat a little bit more. By the why, like me personally, I honestly I can't stand not Slack, but just like I, the the interface of chatting. I feel like it's really intrusive to my my flow. Like, why would you choose chat versus like a message board or somewhere else where you can? I don't know. I feel like. You know, there's probably a lot of knowledge in that group that goes in the conversation that gets lost, right? Somebody asks a question and then, you know, it's not being tagged or archived. So, you know, two months later, somebody else can ask the same question instead of finding that kind of knowledge. Like, how do you, like, do you, do you agree or like, why did you chose chat? Was it because like loneliness type of thing that you want to, like, what was the reason? I think it was really just the MVP, the, the concept of having an MVP. It was so quick to set up. Okay. So it was like a, a couple of seconds and, and it happened. But then we actually did try to build out our own message board um, platform for design ship. But people still liked the idea of chatting okay. because it was a very low commit. Hmm. And um, that's why the whole, the alpha product that we built, um, I think it's actually still live. It lost momentum because hmm people just found there was a bigger hurdle in, if I want to ask a simple question, I didn't want to hit post, type in a title, type in a message and then hit, and then wait for someone. They were, they actually really enjoyed Slack's ability to just pop in a quick question and bang, you get an answer straight away. Mm. So I think that's what people uh, tend to, yeah, enjoyed a little bit more. Okay. So that's what we've maintained. That's the chat, uh, chat platform. Yeah. That's interesting. I think that, I don't know if you did this like consciously or not, but you did a lot of things, as you said, to build your brands, which were very, very smart as like grow community and email list, then now this Slack channel and like a lot of it, um, you know, brings back, you know, you give a lot to the community and you get back a lot in return. Um, is that something that you just did naturally? Like, Yeah, I guess it's always been a part of like, I guess who I am, because I think like if you're, if you're not really a person who enjoys doing that, giving back, because it is hard work. It's, it's not, uh, it's not easy to constantly give back on a daily basis. So it's actually something I really do enjoy. Um, I mentor, I actually mentor a number of designers in, uh, in Australia. So I catch up with them, see how things are going. I actually mentor some, I'm, uh, marketer as well. I don't even know much about marketing uh, as a, like a full-time marketing uh, employee, but at least I can apply the principle that I've learned in sort of like building teams and, and all that with him. So it's something that I just do enjoy. I, I enjoy doing. So I think it just comes very naturally. Uh, but yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's something that I actually do enjoy. So that's why I always turn, turn to that. Cool. So what's the, what's like the, the, the current challenge or the next challenge that you're trying to to solve, um, to re like, what's, what's the goal that the you're next, working on? I think it's definitely ladder at the moment. Um, I think we definitely want to build out a suite of products for designers and developers, uh, to empower them in their careers. I don't know, obviously when, as you as an entrepreneur, like you have to understand that, like no one idea is perfect. It's really testing different ideas, seeing how the market reacts and learning very quickly. So like they always say, you got to fail fast. So that's that's my plan for the next three months. Um, v and I, we're just heads down, build a product, ship it. Within, by the way, within it, your, your two co-founders, your two co-founders in Ladder? Yeah, so myself and V. Right, and so what's the like responsibility type of, like you're doing design and product and he's doing development? Exactly. Yeah. And I'm also trying, I'm learning a bit of JavaScript. So I'm trying to get into code. Um, he's a little bit worried that I'm going to take over the entire operation and then boot <laughs> him out. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, the clear responsibility is that uh, I'll be doing design and product and he's sort of devving it up. But we, we bounce ideas all the time. We're, we're very open in our communications, which is like great for us. Amazing. Sounds, sounds incredible. I was also 
trying to go that way i had a SaaS product and build it out and, and try to scale it um eventually we sold it because it didn't scale fast enough i guess or it wasn't sustainable in terms of like generating revenue and, and stuff like that do you also have kind of like goals that you know that you know first of all you said because you're doing it full time i was doing that while freelancing on the side but you kind of have your runway and if you're not going to reach some kind of goal um, by that time, are you going to move away from it or like? Yeah. So yeah, because V and I, we're very sort of a uh, business, like uh, sort of results driven. We have defined ourselves sort of like three months, um, three months. We, so by ne Wednesday next week, we need to launch MVP within three months. We will assess what sort of traction we have. Um, it's more of like a, we haven't, like, we haven't done a hard sort of like number metric to, to work towards. I think the both of us will have some sort of gut feeling whether or not we should continue doing this full time or if it will become like a part time sort of like product that we build on the side. So we just have to be very realistic with ourselves, uh, whether or not it requires us to be full time, um, or does, or is it more of a part time thing? Let the product simmer in the market for a bit, get people uh, familiar with the brand. They'll use it, we learn from it, and then we start building it out slowly. Um, but all if maybe 100,000 developers join on board and we're like, holy crap, we have a suite of stuff to build out right now. So we're, we're letting the markets sort of determine how we should proceed. Yeah. But we are going to definitely be aggressive with like how we reach out, um, working late nights, getting things out. That's all, part, that's all part of the startup game. I think a lot of designers right now are interested in building their own product or, or business. What would be a takeaway from, from the time that you're doing it full time that you can give kind of like as an advice to people starting out by mm. building a product or, you know, going at it? Yeah, yeah. That's a good question. I think for designers, to market, your time to market is probably the most important thing. Um, your product will never be perfect. Um, and it's going to require you to try number a, a ton of times before you actually get it right. So I think Vlad, the CEO um, of uh, Webflow actually tweeted recently his journey to uh, his Webflow journey. And it was like 10, it's over the span of like 15 or so years. And he's actually built, he's tried to build Webflow like seven or eight times. It's someone like that and a product like that. We sort of just, we see it and we're like, oh, it's like, it's Webflow. It's been around for maybe one or two years. It's just, it's happened like that, right? But no, it's ha it's required him to fail so many so many times, and it's required him so many years just to get to just to get to where he is today. So I think with designers, we tend to be a perfectionist. We tend to be like um, we want to be perfect. We want to launch something that looks great, works well. But you just never know how people will interact with your product. You never know how they'll use your product, and you'll never know what they think of your product until you get it into the market. So I think if you have an idea. Put something together that's that looks okay, works okay, and solves the problem that you're, you're trying to solve, and just set, put it out there and see what, and see what people say about it. I think that's the core in what you should do. You should never be working on something for more than sort of three months um, without anyone talking about it or ever, anyone using it. That's probably my tip for for them. Amazing, Michael. All right, thank you so much for coming to the show, and I wish you like all the best with Ladder. I really hope to see it succeed and uh, it really looks amazing and you're doing a lot to the community. So thank you so much for everything that you do and for all the knowledge that you shared. And uh, yeah, good luck, man. Thank you, thank you so much, man. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be part of the show. All right, talk to you soon, man. Bye-bye. Awesome, see ya.